Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne. I am uh, putting this video together, this interview, as part of the JAL uh, Multiliteracies Department Columns. Uh, basically what we do is we put together a column uh, in each issue and we talk about some issues in uh, digital literacy or technology and how it impacts teaching in the classroom. Uh, this latest column that we put together was on computational thinking and computational participation. And we're starting to uh, bridge the gap to coding and programming in the classroom. And so uh, one of the interviews that we have set up is with uh, Tom. Tom, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm uh, Tom Liam Lynch. I'm the Assistant Professor of Education Technology at Pace University in downtown um, Manhattan, yeah, so in New York City. And uh, I'm in my beginning my fourth year here at Pace. Prior to that point, I taught, um, I was in the New York City Public Schools for nine years as an English teacher, as a technology coach. Um, and then my last few years was working for their central offices on a large scale online learning initiative where I was, I worked in kind of implementation management and then I directed um, the project there toward the end. So um, thank you for coming on. I've been looking forward yeah. to this and, and picking your brain. Uh, the, the column was talking about coding and programming, but we sort of pull back a little bit and suggest you know, we should talk about computational thinking and computational participation. And it's all in the column um, and the, the Google Doc is online. When you work with teachers, when you work with your students, um, how do you how do you define coding or programming? Like, what's your definition? How, what's your elevator pitch? How do you make it understandable for uh, those learners? Yeah, three, three little words, which is, you know, it's all language. And so I, I really try to focus on the fact that when we're talking about, um, I tend to use the word um, software for these things, and and there's there's reasons for it. Um, you know, coding might refer to you know you say coding, and it can mean lots of things to lots of different people, um, and you know so they might be thinking of a specific language, they might be just picturing that scene in the Matrix where like all the stuff you know kind of rains down. Um, I tend to go to the word software because it, it, it takes into account not just the um, programming languages that are at play, but also, especially when you, when you think about things like software engineering and, and software development, there's actually a lot of human language as well that's necessary to making, to build the product and then to make it all work. Um, but I don't get into that right away with students necessarily, but I, um, but I do talk about languages a lot. And so, like, so for example, I'm teaching an English methods course um, this coming spring. And one of the things that I fold into the English methods, it's, it's structured around like past, present, future of, of teaching English. And so we do some history. Um, we do some of the, kind of what are the current realities with education reform and Common Core and all of these things. But then I also have this kind of this future part as well. And when I when I envision kind of what an English class, and for example, might look like years from now, um, I envision it as being necessarily a place where. Um, uh, where K-12 computer science is like is embedded. Um, and like I would envision a world where we teach computer science or programming the, with using some of the methods and things we know about teaching writing um, you know, to students as well. Because when you use the word language to, um, to talk about code, um, when you use the word language, like you, you approach it differently. Like it's no longer like, oh, I don't, I don't know what coding is, um, but rather it's like, it's, it's another language. And, so you ask language related questions, meaning like, you know, if, if it's a language, then what are what are words and sentences and paragraphs here? You know, what does it mean? There's I'm doing um, I'm doing a course now, kind of a refresher course in um, in Python through Coursera and the instructor, you know, and I didn't know that he was going to do this, but he talks about reading code like a story. You know, what does it mean to look at you know language this way? So I do try to emphasize like that we're talking about languages and if and when you do that you know i think there's real there can be real opportunities for students to move from having this like deficit mindset of i don't know what coding is it's you know and it's mysterious and it's fast and i'm not a you know i'm not a i'm not a guy in a dorm room with a hoodie on you know hunched over in the middle of the night trying to you know hack something so i don't know what this is and when you approach it as language, it's like, well, you have fluency in language and probably language is, you know, and we could sit and look at it, even if you don't speak English as your first language, which again, which is another really rich, I think, um, reason to, per, to think about coding as a language when we have 
especially in urban areas and different parts of the country. Like we have, we have students who, for whom, you know, um, they have language fluency, just not in English. Um, but all languages have syntax and all languages have different effects on different audiences and or readers. So what does it mean to position the computer as an audience, for example, right? What does it mean? And, and when you look at the way I think successful computer science teachers teach um, based on, especially based on this recent course I'm doing with Coursera, it's they, there is this tendency to like humanize the machine, you know? So they'll do things like, you know, you'll get an error message and they'll be like, you know, in this one particular course, he'll go, you know, it's not Python saying you're bad or you're dumb. It's Python saying, help me, I don't understand. Um, and that works actually, because what he's actually doing is he's, he's reminding you that this is a language and like any language you're communicating with an audience. There's a and in in this in this world there's you know what's really interesting about code is like there's the there's the immediate kind of CPU audience the computation the computer audience, but then there's also this like it's there are these other people who have who who build and design the language and other things that you're plugging into so there are these other human beings kind of way behind the scenes as well, um, you know one thing I would just I think I would say too, um, and like one of the and I, I'm thinking this probably with my um, my students um, in mind, you know, who, who I'll be meeting in the next couple of weeks. I think it's also important to to be um, to be kind of sober in the ways that we justify why coding is worth anyone's time anyway. Like rather, than we get this in in that you know, I have kind of the English kind of English teacher hat and the technology hat, and there's nothing about either of those hats that uniquely prepares someone to to get into coding or the computer science ed part. Um, but I do think there's a tendency to regard some things. Technology gets this all the time um, as like it's it's assumed to be valuable. You know, there's a great book we use in our ed tech program here at the university called Distrusting Educational Technology by Neil Selwyn. And he does a great job of saying, like, it's not like it's almost certainly not worth it. And if you think it's worth it, like then these are the these are the reasons that it could be worth it. Um, Larry Cuban does some very similar work with his historical um, stuff around technology that it's all, it almost always fails us, like regardless of whatever the hype is, right? So what is it that actually makes coding worth anyone's time anyway? And aside from the usual discourses around, um, it's about, you know, there's an economic need. What's getting all the funding right now is that companies are freaking out that they don't have people to fill all these development roles that they need. Um, software dev roles that they need. And the government sees that as a way to also help boost the economy while supporting private sector, and you kind of get all of this this buzz. Um, the reason to do this, I wrote this in the, the piece we were discussing um, earlier, the piece I wrote on Medium called um, Saving Computer Science Education from Itself. Um, the reason to pursue this is not because, um, you know, Facebook needs more developers. Like, that's not the right reason to pursue this. I even say in there, I have a six-year-old son. He started public school, kindergarten. Um, he's in first grade, actually, now. And, um, you know, I said, I don't want, I don't want him, I want him to, to have, to be exposed to computer science, um, not in a club, not in a computer science class, but in every subject. And I don't want him to be exposed to it because it's going to make him rich or it's going to make him employable. If those things happen, that's great. I want him exposed to this because software coding is what is mediating and shaping more and more, not just of how we communicate or express ourselves, but it's shaping the way like democracy works. And that's that's the part I need him to be able to understand. Our problems as a society, as a culture, are going to increasingly have elements of software involved. And the more that you can understand what's going on there and inform that, the better. Um, the more that you can leverage those sorts of things to get a collective voice around an issue and to and to act and to bring change into the world, um, the more empowered you'll be as a citizen, like as a human being. Um, if you work at Facebook, great, maybe I don't know if they're, if they're, if they're around when he's eligible. Um, but uh, but that that's sort of that's where I'm where I'm coming from. Yeah, I think it's um, I'm I'm very I'm concerned. I am, you know, I just talked to my students today. I said, you know, when I look at technology, to me, it is a literacy, you know, and I talk about all the reasons why. I talk about, you know, opportunities to empower yourself, also governments closing things down, and I and I had the same concern. I didn't talk about it there in that class, but that 
increasingly our world is very digital and we're getting tracked and there is uh, a lot of power in understanding what's happening behind the scenes. And, and I, I agree, I want my children, you know, to be able to understand that there is language behind what they're doing and the tools they're using and how they're using them. There's language behind it. Understand that language. And if they don't feel like that represents them, recreate or rewrite that language, you know, that, that's what I would, I would love. So. Absolutely. I mean, I'll just, just to build on that for a moment, you know, um, no, a few years ago now, this is all through race of the top money that different states got in New York state got 700 million in race of the top fund. And that kind of, that sparked all of these reforms in the state. And that could be, and that would be another long conversation um, about what all that was and wasn't. Um, but one of the things that they, that it encouraged then was for states to, was to aggregate and report on massive amounts of student data and teachers data as well. So there was this third party entity that was established called InBloom. And in Bloom was essentially what was going to happen is multiple states who took race of the top money and who had philanthropic funding as well. They were they were essentially um, encouraged, coerced, you choose your word, but to take that student and teacher level data um, and to structure it a very specific way that all these different states were going to agree to do it, um, and then to feed it to in Bloom. In Bloom was going to be using all of these encryption services to store it. Um, and it was essentially going to have it was going to have all of these benefits for um, private sector and for some for some policymakers. What it was going to do is it, one, it was going to give you this kind of national bird's eye view of student achievement, right? So if you're defining learning as test scores, then this was a very very enticing thing. Um, the other thing that was they were going to do is because they had all of this data. Um, that was structured the same way, right? And data structures, it's not the language per se, right? But this is a, this is a part of that world of, of coding of software, right? That you would hope, that I think we're talking about. If it's all structured a certain way, then what InBloom was also doing is they were positioning themselves to be an intermediary to private companies to build like web apps or data dashboards that could be marketed to not just, not, not one district, right? Who's near your offices, but to Districts, districts everywhere. Parents freaked out for lots of different reasons in the state. Um, even though I did talk to some security experts who work in this world, and they're like, you know, the encryption they're doing is actually, you know, it's 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 at like bank level, you know, like they are. So it wasn't actually it wasn't about the the technicity of the of the encryption or anything like that. But it was it it was freaking people out for lots of different reasons, and I think rightly so. And to give you an example of one of the things that I found, I wrote about this in my book. Um, called The Hidden Role of Software um, in Educational Research Pro Policy to Practice. Um, there's the plug. The One of the things that I look at, though, in the book is how if you actually examine the developer documents that they use for InBloom, which you can't find now online because InBloom has since shut down and they're all gone, cleaned up shop. Um, but if you look at the developer documents, one of the things that they, re they have all of these fields that they're reporting on your kit, right? Or they're potentially going to report on. One of them is that if you had an incident, an official incident in a school where you might have gotten into a fight, right, with another kid, and it was formally written up by an AP, uh, an assistant principal, and then put into the system, that could show up, right, in this data set. So then when you look at the way in which they structure the, de like the data, um, the requested data for this, um, for, for this particular, um, um, for this particular section, you, you see things like type of weapon used. When you look at the type of weapon used, it was fascinating to see that there were, um, there was, it was not organized in an alphabetical way at all. So there's this arbitrariness to the way it's organized. There were no fewer than five different types of knives that were articulated. Gun was listed once, and then they had these other weapons. But then you start to ask yourself, like, well, what are the kinds? What are the kinds of things in schools we're most concerned about? Knives or guns, right? Why have five of these? Are perhaps knife incidents more pop, more uh, frequent? You know, of some students in some kinds of schools, and maybe is guns maybe less frequent? Like you start to ask these questions about like what are the assumptions that the people who made this? What are the assumptions they have about who our kids are, right? Who what our schools are. And, and that part, that's the part that, that to me that, you know, and this is drifting away from coding a little bit and we, and we can bring it back to it, but it's coding's tip of the iceberg, 
you know, you want to, when you get into this other part, like the way taxonomies or metadata schemas are constructed and the effects of those, because all you see, all you see on the front end, all you see in the user interface is a simple little drop down menu, right? And whatever those things are at the top of the list, those are going to get read first. And if something looks like it fits the bill, they're not going to get to the bottom. And, and that's on a kid's record and that's getting fed to the state that's getting fed to this other, you know, and so, um, so when we're talking about coding or about software, and we're talking about the democratic kind of ideals that surround it, or the specific ideals at least that, that surround it, you know, I think it's 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 certainly about coding, um, and then and coding in the broadest sense because you get into this other world of how information architecture works and and data feeds and APIs work and things like that, and it's you know there's um, there there's even more to uncover. Well, I mean, it, you started by saying that coding was about language. And, you know, as part of that, there's a lot of, uh, it's interesting to see how coding is now very connected to philosophy. When you talk about like coding of like, you know, autonomous vehicles and you start to think about what are the perspectives and what are the philosophies of the, the person that's sitting there banging this out, you know, and, and dumping it in to make things happen. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, what, so if we talk about this in the column, we try to say, as, as you said before, you know, the end goal might not be that you, your kids become coders and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about coding or programming, if, if your students don't ultimately become coders or programmers, it doesn't mean that you are a failure. We try to suggest that, you know, there's an opportunity to build in computational thinking, computational participation, and, you know, unpack those nuances, start to think about language, start to think about decision-making, start to think about philosophies. Um, do how is that currently happening in the classroom? Like, what connections are there between that and classroom instruction, and what could or should be happening in the classroom? Yeah, you know the um, that's a great question. I mean, I think what we see, what I'm seeing right now, with and again, I'm based in New York City, and I know kind of, you know, I know really kind of deeply what's been going on in New York City and in New York State over the last number of years. And you know what we, what I keep seeing are major pushes toward computer science education that one is it's it's not framed as this is part of our democratic or our civic duty we've got to do this better and i think i think in general we suffer from a lack of clarity over the purpose of public education in general and, and that lack of definition anyone can plug in whatever reason they want and then that's why we kind of have this whiplash effect in in, in, in education um, but they don't start there but regardless what you then see is this kind of wave of you know coding clubs, hackathons, um, a push to have AP computer science, um, you know, advanced placement computer science in schools. What you, what, what I'm seeing in, in schools currently is, um, and even with the, the increased emphasis uh, and interest in all of this, is you have these, what I would say are, um, are kind of boutique, you know, solutions that certainly could have value like i don't mean boutique can have a negative connotation by boutique i just mean that they're kind of circumscribed in their reach um and they are by their nature they're going to be um separate from most of what the, the student is doing in school all day and very likely what they're doing in home uh, for the rest of the day um and i um i envision that there there are actually really rich ways to integrate computer science um, into all subjects. Like, I, I think it's totally possible to see it um, everywhere. That's not what we're certainly seeing right now. Um, and, you know, when I think what makes it hard is that I, I think partly I, I fear that we're not asking the, the right questions the right way to even get to the point where we could envision um, thinking about computer science not as something to be compartmentalized and kind of, you know, shoved to the end of the school day or into this elective. Um, but if it's really that important, then it should be, it should be all over the place. And we're not, we're not asking certain kinds of questions that way. Um, and I'm, I'd, I'd love to talk more about that because I think the, the, one of the answers could be in thinking of, com of coding or of computer science more in terms of language and of, of writing and composition rather than, um, you know, than as this technical, you know, kind of black box. The other thing, though, I would add about what I, you know, in terms of what I think we're currently seeing in schools, um, is I think the approach that we're taking right now is inherently 
um, in many cases, is tends to be very inequitable and unsustainable. This is especially with regard to, I think, what's happening in New York and to some other cities that are, they have this kind of windfall of money they're trying to like, which comes with like the State of the Union address when it's, you know, computer science for all kids is, is mentioned. Our mayor did something very similar um, in a YouTube video um, back in the fall. Um, and when I say it's, it's, it strikes me as um, inequitable and unsustainable, what I mean by that is the as long as it's a club or as long as it's an elective, it's not something that can impact and reach all students fairly. It's going to be the place that you go to for exceptional reasons because you have the time, um, because they need, you know, administrators need somewhere to put you, because you show an interest, because your parents can afford to pay the little extra for this or that. Um, but it's it's by its nature, it's not going to reach everyone. Everyone's not going to have an equal opportunity to have access to those kinds of experiences. And what we've seen, and uh, this happens with the arts in particular now in schools, is like the schools that are that are losing the arts are the schools who feel most under pressure to get test scores up or have students who need the most help. So these things like a computer club or a coding club seems like uh, like a luxury, like a, something leisurely that you know the serious schools wouldn't have time um, to do. I think sustainability is also a concern simply because the the kinds of interest and money that come along with those, these sorts of, um, of pushes nowadays, it dries up. And when it dries up, you can, you can have had all of these wonderful um, partnerships that look great on press releases. And you can, you can create, create these fantastic videos that show all these different types of students coding and doing all of this stuff. And when the money dries up, it's all gone. So in, if we're thinking seriously about sustainability, um, there are a couple ways to ensure its sustainability. Um, some at the noble, some at the ignoble, I think, end of things. Like one would be to test it in some high stakes way and then people pay attention to it, sadly. I think the, the higher road on it is to, you know, is to treat computer science and is to treat coding more along the ways that we've, we've tried to and continue trying to teach writing and reading and literacy in schools, which, you know, I, I think back to the, um, and which I'm sure you're familiar with the writing across the curriculum move for about 20, 25 years now, I don't know. But um, but there was this there was this period where, and you can go to, I think it's Colorado State has this incredible archive of all of these free open materials from from that are collected for writing across the curriculum. This idea that writing is something that should exist everywhere, that we should support it both in practice and theory and research, that, you know, I mean, that was, there was something incredibly powerful about it conceptually as a way to affect change in schools. Um, and I was saddened when the Common Core came out and there was no serious mention of it. Like it was almost like, you know, and this is, and this is something we have to be aware of, like things, things will get branded and rebranded, but it wasn't in, it wasn't in the, the Common Core folks, architects, it wasn't in their interest to say there's this great thing that was done already that if we're really talking about literacy in all content areas, we should be doing this because they've, and they already have materials, they have experts, they have this, you know, it's much more profitable politically, economically to say there's this new thing that we've done that we're working with publishers to, to do. Um, but coding could, could learn from that. You know, what would it mean? One of the things I, um, I'm writing about right now is it, is this, or I'm playing with is this idea of like, uh, of co is, is content area coding. Like, what does it mean? What does it mean, especially at the secondary level? Um, what does it mean to think about um, the relationship between coding or computer science and and content areas, which have been in existence for a hundred years, which I think everyone would agree some of the some of the richest learning happens when those content areas are um, are merged or ignored. But those do rem the content areas, the main the content areas do remain a way that we kind of organize and think about schooling. Um, I think there are really rich possibilities for pursuing, computer science and coding like in a content area um you know so one example would be you know it's not um you know it's it's not about saying you know everyone learn this particular language or this one and then you do some project that you know you made a star wars game great job you know and like and maybe that's maybe who knows maybe that's like a, a good fix and it gets someone over the initial hump and that's that's fine that there, there can there's some value in that but if you really want to make it equitable sustainable rigorous if you want to connect it to like the realities of what education it has been and is and, and will likely be in the United States for a while. I think, you know, it, it's more interesting to me to say, like, what are the particular ways that 
um, that coding can be integrated into, let's say, the English classroom or the social studies classroom or the science classrooms that deepens what it means to study in that discipline. Like, so it's not about it's not about some like BS like project that we're all going to do or something along those lines. It's about saying, you know, English teachers, you know, we know you're studying Shakespeare. So in April, you know, we've we've got we have a project where we're going to focus on a particular way to analyze not one of Shakespeare's works. We want to look at them all. We want to see how you know how how is love and death or any other thematic combination how do they play out across all his works chronologically. And we want to create visualizations to see that stuff. Here are some examples, this, 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 and this. And by the way, we'll be using Python or R to do that. Like the, you, you, I think it, it keeps coding in its, in its proper place, if that makes sense. It's like, meaning it's not, a, no one has room for another thing in schools. You know, we already, we're already, we're already like, we're, we're packed, we're good, right? Um, and if, if folks want to change that, then that's, that's a related but separate conversation. If it's about working within where we currently are, then it has to, then the way in which we bring coding to especially secondary classrooms, I think has to, it has to honor the uniqueness of the disciplines and of the passions of the teachers who have committed themselves to those disciplines. Um, and so it's not helpful to say, we're gonna have a coding workshop for all teachers today after school from blah, 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 blah. Um, like that's, that, that is as um, inauthentic and kitschy as it sounds. You know, I think it's it's you have to say like what what are our subject area teachers passionate about, and what are ways that we can help them grow as professionals through this? What are the ways that we can excite the kids through this? You know, um, but that's more of the way. You know, that's the more of the way I would imagine, um, or that's more the direction I'd love to see us going. Well, you said earlier that it's uh, you know having connection between coding or programming or this this thinking and where teachers currently are what we what we have to do mm -hmm. um, so most of the the audience of jaw is you know we're, we have a literacy focus you know we uh are, are in higher ed we're adults we are secondary educators but also like we said before the the, the call that we wear many hats and we have work in ila and and ncte and across multiple spectrums um, so one of the things that we try to bring across all content areas, all classes, is literacy. Um, so what connections do you see, and you talked a little bit about this already, what connections do you see between coding or programming or the thinking we discussed in the column and literacy activities? Totally. Um, if one, first and foremost, it's a language. I mean, we're talking about, mostly we're talking about languages. Um, and you, the you, literacy researchers, using that term broadly, um, bring such a rich, like tr just trove of concepts and methods that like that if they, if we were to flip those onto the what it means for children and adults to learn coding, like we would we would be asking radically different questions that would be very productive, I think, for not just our field but for edu for anybody thinking about computer science and education or anything like that. Um, you know, so for example, and there's a little bit of this um, comes out in your column as well, where it's, you know, it's that idea of moving from it. You're not the lone coder in your dorm room, but it's a social practice. Well, the notion of coding as a social practice or literacy as a social practice is something that many literacy researchers were quite well versed in, right? We were aware of the tensions in the field around that and practices versus events and like, and all, you know, we've got, we have, we have such, we have, we could ask really, really different questions um, there. You know, I think as well, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm taking this um, online course in Coursera on Python. It's kind of a refresher. And, you know, the the uh, the instructor of the course, like, talks about learning to code in terms of, he's like, think about sentences and paragraphs and stories. You know, like, sentences, paragraphs, stories. Like, that's isn't, you know, not to be territorial, but that's our turf, right? Like, that's those, we're really comfortable asking questions related to that stuff. What kinds of questions would we ask um, if we were focused on, you know, sites of study that that were on that were about how adults, how teachers, or how students learn to code, um, you know, as part of the course I'm doing right now, I'm I'm not. It'll either be probably a narrative or an autoethnographic kind of um, study, but I'm I'm keeping research notes of my of my experience at the same time, you know, with kind of like the the kind of literacy English hat on. Like, what are all of these? What are these questions? Like, one of the things I wrote the other day 
around this was um, he was talking about different programming languages. And I'm most familiar with, I've done the like HTML, CSS, um, JavaScript kind of thing before. Um, I was really focused on R last year, which is a statistical programming language that has a lot of rich kind of data visualization um, uses. Um, and now this is sort of the year of, of going back to Python, which I've used for some projects in the past, but I want to focus on it. But I said, you know, have you been exposed to different languages? Like, and maybe the word languages is gets in the way sometimes because in reality, there's a, more more tends to be the same in like the big popular ones than totally different. Like, is it more helpful to think of these different languages as genres, maybe rather? And when you say genre, like just and that's a word, right? That to people outside the research community might strike them as like a sign on a Barnes and Noble bookshelf for however long those are around. Um, Barnes and Nobles, I mean, but um, but when you use the word genre, it has it has all of this other kind of theoretical richness that would prod us to ask different questions about well, in, in what ways does is this language like socially constructed for a specific kind of purpose at a specific time? Like you just you just ask really really different questions. Um, so I think that there's, I think that those are those are some of the ways I think that literacy researchers could bring such value to to this world because these aren't these are not even close to the kinds of questions that um, that you often hear computer science education researchers asking, certainly not related to K-12, very few actually focus, you, you happen to have paired up with some of the few who do, but very few actually focus on K-12. I mean, there's been much more of an interest in computer science at the higher ed level and how, you know, and what that has tended to mean what computer science ed, I think, um, refers to. Um, so I do think that when we kind of embody the, like, did the, when we think about the, um, the linguistic nature of code and of programming languages, um, I think that we we can bring to the table some very, very, very different questions. And I also would say to um, colleagues who, who, are, who are thinking about this, in addition to our own theory, uh, more theory than methods, but especially in addition to our own kind of theoretical work that we've, we've been doing for so long, um, there, there's so much to learn as well from um, from others who we who whom we're not reading right now, um, and the main field that I think has the most to add um, is the field of software studies, or sometimes referred to as software theory. Um, and actually, if you don't, I'm gonna let me grab some books. Let me just we'll show them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go for it. Cool. Um, these are these three. These are great. Um, even these would just do for now. Okay. I mean, I'll just use a few just to like make the points, right? Like, there's um, this is an awesome book called Software Theory um, by Frederica Farbetti. She's a media and kind of culture scholar at Oxford Brookes University, um, and this she's writing about the, the 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 philosophically like what is software. Like just what is, and she has a she's a she has a background as a developer, um, and she has this you know kind of really rich. So she she uses Derrida to break down like software as language, right? For much of the opening, and she draws on some of the philosophy of technology as well, and um, and whatnot. But you know she says things in here like you know paper shapes software, like this to to think of coding as something like digital is is totally not helpful because it's like that we're just we we miss the point it's a language and as all languages it's unstable well what happens when you're using unstable un unstable languages to construct this world we're living in now we're relying on it so heavily so she does is you know the first couple chapters are are pretty dense um but then the rest of it it's like she just she has these like incredible ways of framing what software is um as it relates to code as it relates to um developer documents that's around it final applications. She even gets down in the last chapter, you know, she goes down to like machine code level. And she's like, what happens to like human intention when it goes through these different layers of translation from one's will or collective will of developers who put together some documents to, you know, these high level languages we program in, and then they get converted, right? They get all those languages are not, and that's not what the computer, the computer needs like electrical impulses to say like on or off. Like it really is the ones and zeros, right? When you get down to the machine level. So like what happens, she says, like as you go down these different levels. So she's explaining this, if you've got your literacy researcher hat on, like what's going through your mind 
you know, about about language and, and about the relationship between language and 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 identity and and you know and and and, and the socio socio cultural impact of like language like all of these questions come out. She's not asking the educational questions, the education related questions, because that's not her field. But we will learn a lot from thinking about some of those things. Um, this one's awesome. He's great. Love Manovich. He wrote this book. This is his newer, his newer book called um, Software Takes Command. His early book that was kind of, I think, made his reputation was this one. It's often done in like media studies courses it's called the Language of New Media. But in both of these books, like he's really grappling again with like, what's the nature of software as it pertains to human culture and the way in which and its effects on the outside world. And, you know, he has, I mentioned to you, I think earlier before we got on, like he's got one of the concepts he says is that, you know, for most of human history, it was narrative that provided the logic for how human beings kind of make sense of their experiences and structure information in their lives. So the exam, the way I, uh, the great example of it would be in like in Homer, the way in which all the details around like the catalog of ships and who's related to whom and all that, it's done in this very narrative storytelling way. It's done in a poem, right? So he would say the same thing. It was done in stories, it was done in novels and these different time periods have different ways that we have traditionally relied on narrative to make sense of our world, to structure information in certain ways. And as of the fifties, the database became the way that we started to organize those things. And it's only increasing. And so he argues in this book, and he brings it up back in here, that like it's there's a ten, there's an inherent tension between database logic and narrative, and he gets into that real like what does it mean to be a literacy re researcher and to consider that tension like what is he talking about for one, and then how true is it what he's saying and what does it mean for the kinds of questions I ask about coding about technology, um, the final one and I brought this one up just because uh, you mentioned philosophy earlier. If you're interested in um, philosophy, like a philosophical take on software, especially its effects on society and kind of where we're going, um, where different cultures are going with it, et cetera, this book by David Barry called um, The Philosophy of Software is like phenomenal for that. And again, he's doing really, really, he does, he's got a section in here. This is how I read my books, right? I don't know how you are with it. I like you know, anyone else watching, I'd love to know. I'd love, I'd love for you to do it. One of these where people just show how they make sense of stuff. You know, how do you read? How do you yeah. mark things up? Yeah, it's like it could be called "What's Your Mess?" You know, like how do you, you know how do you how do you mess around and make sense of things? But you know, he's got to your point from earlier. He looks at code as poetry. He looks at the way um, code is being used increasingly for um, for elections. And so he takes some of the uh, some of these like an open source kind of library that's used for voting software. So he takes that and he shows what he does like a code analysis. There are methods associated with all these things too, which which these other folks have, right? That we could apply in our field. But he looks at one of the easy things to do, uh, which I which I did in a couple studies and I took from from him, is like you look at the view the source code on web pages that you're focused on as as a particular site of study or or a, a piece of data that you're you know that you're working with, but view the source and see what's under the hood, see if there's anything that's there. Like one of the things that he shows is that when you look at the source code, a little different than a web page, but when you're looking at the source code for this software. Um, for use for voting, you'll see that the developer notes, right? So any like lots of, if it's a, if it's a especially sophisticated piece of software, you're gonna see lots of developer notes that they you leave for each other. It's a, a pound sign or something like that. And he shows how the developers refer to voters as he. Like they, the way in which that they're, they, that the people who constructed this are um, thinking about voters is in the masculine form, and then that translates into the way that they name some of their buttons and instructions at points, right? So he's got this whole really interesting way to ask different kinds of questions about, you know, the um, about the software that's being used around the world. Um, you know, we've seen stuff too, like in multimodal studies. You know, there's there are lots of kind of different ways that have been devised to create data out of you know web pages that you see your videos that you transcribe things like that you know one of the things i do in, in one study again borrowing from some of this stuff is um and i think it was something manovich mentions in passing but it's like you can get a developer tool for your browser or you can get a standalone one that allows you to measure the area of things in precise in pixels so when i was doing an analysis of um a web page for example 
I was able to say like precisely this amount of the web page is made up of this kind of material, right? So when Cress writes about this stuff, when Gunther Cress writes about it, he'll talk about blocks, right? And he's making and then he's and he's using his um, he's using his categorization of certain kinds of blocks as a way as a data a kind of a data set to bring to this analysis he's doing. And there's something compelling about it actually, and it works it works well. But imagine how much it's strengthened when you're able to say, with a simple little tool, it's not just blocks, but it's this percentage of the page is taken up with this this kind of thing. Um, so there's lots of us. There's a lots that we can learn um, by not just from ourselves and by applying what we know about literacy studies to coding as a literacy practice, but also by reaching out to these other fields. And again, I think software studies or software theories, especially a really, really rich one um, for us to to get involved with more, you just start asking different questions, you know? And, and I think that's that that should be what drives so much of what we do, um, is just that pursuit of better questions. It seems like from a researcher perspective, the best thing to do is reach out to those communities, think about those texts, you know, figure out how that pushes our buttons and pushes our own considerations of, of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we started talking about teachers and, and we'll finish talking about teachers. Um, let's say we have a, a K-12 or a higher ed instructor and they, you know, they're, they're not tuning in to watch a discussion about coding and programming and computational thinking and participation unless they're already interested. Mm -hmm. um, so for those educators that are, are, are watching or listening and they, they want to do this, but they don't know the first step. We know a lot of times in, in education, it's like, okay, what do I do tomorrow? So what are the first steps? So they say, I, I agree with you, I agree 100%. What's the first step that they start with? That's a great question. I think it, on a certain level, it depends on whether they're interested in this more for themselves or more for themselves with their, their teacher kind of identity and hat on. If it's about yourself, and some and that and that's a perfectly fine starting point like in our, our identities are very inseparable right when when we're in this in this work i mean i think that coursera does a really nice job of offering you know free or close to free courses that um are very structured there's no, they're not glitchy or confusing which can when you go into the open world there's a lot of really rich stuff out there the the challenge can be for someone who especially doesn't maybe isn't 100 percent committed to the pursuit um can be like the first time a link is broken or doesn't work, like they're done. Um, so you do get a little bit of kind of the quality control stuff there, but those kinds of open courses, I think, um, are really great places to start just to get just to get a sense of like what when someone says Python, I don't even know what they're talking about, or when someone talks about coding, I don't even like I have no idea. Like, well, I remember the first time I someone told me like, oh, well, you just you go to your terminal in a Mac and you can just start there. I didn't even know what the terminal was. And when I opened it, I thought I thought I was like destroying my computer. I thought it was not something I was supposed to see, you know? Um, so I think that those kinds of courses can be very helpful for that reason. Um, I think if it's with the teaching hat on, one, the first, first step, absolute first step is find a friend. <laughs> like find someone else who's also intrigued, not committed, intrigued by this. Like we don't even have to go for commitment at first. Um, and then I think there's there's a, an opportunity to um, focus on your content area and ask yourself like what's what cool stuff is going on with like comp coding and teaching literature or coding and art or coding and dot 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 and start exploring together the stuff you're finding online. So for example, as an English teacher. If you look up kind of coding and literature, or you you know you start doing all the keywords, then you put in coding, you put in software, you put in this, you know you, you know how it can go. You'll you might eventually come across some of the work going on in the digital humanities. There are digital humanities professors, centers who are doing such interesting work where they'll take large you know all novels written in the 18th century, and they'll you know they'll essentially quantify them and graph things about them. So is it is it some unfound truth? No, but they're asking really different questions, and they're and it's and they're the visualizations are usually pretty good looking in terms of their their appeal, their aesthetic, right? 
So the question going to be like, well, what's a version of this I could do with my kids? And like, what my kids, what might my kids get out of this? What might I get out of it? I always tell my students, like, you as the teacher are the most important person in that room. Like, regardless, it's not, it's not sacrilege. Like, it's not. But if if you don't take your own interests as a learner and put them first, like, then you start to lose your impact on on the students either immediately or certainly over time. So, what excites you about? this kind of thing you're seeing and what it means for your understanding of your content area and what might it mean for your kids. Um, for art teachers, for example, like if you, uh, and sometimes these go along with languages, sometimes they go along with like uses. So like did data visualizations or text, um, um, computational text analysis and data visualization is something that um, English teachers and history teachers might find really interesting. And the field of the digital humanities kind of covers in searching, like you'll start to find stuff related to that. Art teachers might find um, did the digital arts really interesting, especially what's going on with processing, the language processing, um, which is often used to do like, so um, you might process, might processing might be used to create um, those effects you see behind rock stars on stages when there's like all of those pretty awesome kind of shapes and morphing and stuff like processing can be used for that. It can be used in all sorts of kind of very, very creative ways. Math and science teachers have a lot of um, supports in place already, mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, I do think that there's, um, I tend to associate with some of the uses I see in those subjects, like a language like R, and I don't mean to make that it's like only English teachers should only use Python and art teachers should use processing. But I do think there could be a rich question about, like maybe some of these languages and their, their, their predominant uses right now, maybe certain languages are actually well suited with content areas. Um, and R is one, again, it's focused on like statistics and doing certain sorts of, and it could do much more than that. But because of the way in which it's kind of built to deal with quantitative, especially quantitative data and all of that, um, you could see lots of creative ways that might jive well with current science and math curricula anyway, um, where they could dabble in that particular um, language. But um, those would be some initial suggestions. And Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many ways to dive in. You know, it's, it, I, I love your, your thinking about, you know, just find a, a friend that's just intrigued. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Tom, where can people reach you? Uh, where do you live on the internet? You know, where can people reach out and contact and find your work? You know, I uh, I was lucky to get Tom Liam Lynch, T O M L I A M L Y N C H, in almost all forms um, early on years ago. So you can just Google Tom Liam Lynch, and I'll come up. Well, my website is tomliamlynch.com. You'll find me there on Twitter. It's at Tom Liam Lynch. Facebook, Tom Liam Lynch. LinkedIn, Tom Liam Lynch. Um, I was not able to secure. Tom Liam Lynch at, at Gmail. I don't know who got it. Like someone got in there, and I don't know how it happened. Um, but I missed the Gmail boat. But um, other than that, they can they can find me online at Tom Liam Lynch, and uh, and I'm happy to provide any sort of tips or guidance. You know, if uh, if it can be useful. The first step is the website. Yeah, I'd say go to the website because you know you can also do like before. It could be weird, right? You know, you know, you see me on the thing. You go to the website, you'll get a sense of like what's the stuff he's doing, what's he talking about. It's got a little bit about, you know, it's, it's got the Twitter feed, it's got recent posts, it's got all that stuff, a little bit of the CV. Like you can kind of, you get a bit, a bit more of a sense. Um, and then um, that's usually how I email people. Honestly, I love emailing people I see or I books I read. Um, I've had, I've met several of the people, you know, who I just showed before because of that. But I usually like to do a little bit of my own homework and just really get a sense of. Who is this person? What's my real interest? And then, so check out the website. I'll give you tons of information, and uh, and I'm happy to be in touch. Very cool. Uh, so once again, uh, this is a series of interviews that we put together for uh, the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacies. Uh, this is for the Multi Literacies Department. Uh, our latest column was about computational thinking and then computational participation as uh, an inroad, possibly to coding and programming, uh, and start to unpack that. We have a series of interviews coming up, but uh, it was awesome to start off uh, everything with uh, Tom. So, Tom, thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. I appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you. So, please, if you're reading this or reading the column, the column is online, the pre-published version. Uh, the video is out there. I'll strip out the audio and put it online. But please reach out, respond, and reach out on the Internet to say uh, hi to Tom.